Welcome to Activate with Pastor Christian Newsom, a podcast of Journey Church International. Thanks for listening to the Activate podcast with Pastor Christian Newsom. I am Pastor Christian, and I'm glad you have joined me for kind of a special podcast, a little different content uh, on an old platform that we've been putting resources on. Uh, you can either be watching on YouTube today, if you're listening on Spotify or maybe on iTunes. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, there are, if you're brand new to this podcast, more than 200 episodes that have been recorded that are each paired with a Sunday sermon at our church to help you activate your faith, to take lessons that you've learned and put them into practice in everyday situations. And today, and moving forward, we are beginning kind of a brand new use of this platform that about once a month, we'll release a podcast that will serve as a summary to maybe some ministry that's upcoming or a supplement to ministry that we did not have time to get to. And today's podcast is really part two or part B of a two-part sermon that was given Sunday, October 30, 2022 at Journey Church International. Uh, if you are listening to this content far into the, uh, far into the future from October 30th of 2022, uh, you can go to our website, takethejourney.cc. You can go to our sermon series page, to the sermon series, Blessed Assurance, and message four of that sermon series is a message called Eternal Endurance, where while studying through the book of 1 John, we took a look at what the Bible has to say, not only about losing your salvation, but very specifically what the Bible has to say about how once you are really saved, authentically saved, your faith endures to the very end of your life. I don't want to preach the entire message, but it was found in the Bible text of 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 29, and really the two big ideas of that, of that sermon in that series were this. The endurance truth number one that we talked about was this. Walking away from the faith is evidence that you never really had faith. There are some phrases that float around in the church world uh, that while theologically accurate are practically dangerous. Phrases like once saved, always saved. While that's true, It makes you think if you said a prayer at some point in your life, it doesn't matter how you live the rest of your life, um, you are saved forever. And that's not what really the Bible tells us Christianity is. Uh, There's also a phrase in the educational world called eternal security. But really that makes all of our Christian life look like we're we're trying to live for security in heaven rather than trying to live in a relationship with a person called Jesus. So while eternal security is technically and theologically accurate. I think it misses the heart of Christianity. There's also a phrase in deep theological study called perseverance of the saints, but that makes it looks like once Christians are saved, they have to keep their salvation by every day being what Jesus has called them to be. We looked at a phrase that Pastor J.D. Greer gave us um, instead that, that, that is new, but it really hits the bullseye of this teaching on eternal endurance. And it's this, once saved, always following. And while following, always safe. Once you are saved by Jesus, the Bible says you will always follow Jesus. And while you are following Jesus, you always feel safe spiritually. You don't wonder if you have lost your salvation. As a matter of fact, hardly anyone uh, has found themselves rededicating their life or wondering if they're going to go to hell when they're living at a level 10 of their Christian experience, when they're in the Word, when they're in prayer, when they're serving their fellow believers, when they're serving on mission trips. Not very many people at the top of their spiritual experience wonder whether or not they've lost their salvation, because while you're following Jesus, you feel safe with Jesus. So what we said the Bible teaches is that once you're saved, you always follow Jesus. And while you follow Jesus, you always feel safe. The second kind of truth of that message from 1 John 2, 12 through 29 was this. Um, really the best proof of saving faith in your past and eternal life in your future is your present relationship to Jesus and his gospel. It's much better to ask, um, am I saved? Not based on a prayer I said in my past, but today am I living with Jesus and for Jesus? And that doesn't mean we work for our salvation. But it does mean this, the assurance of our salvation is based on our relationship with Jesus and our posture towards him. So we looked at the fact that the best evidence of really authentic faith, not a prayer in your past, not eternity in your future, but like today, 
Are you living for and are you living with Jesus? And we looked at some promises that Jesus gave. I won't read all of the text right now, but Jesus gave us a lot of promises that said, once you're saved, you'll follow, and once you follow, you're safe. Uh, he told us in John chapter 6, verses 37 through 39, that, that nobody that God gives him will he ever lose. Uh, Jesus is not going to lose you. He said in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29, um, that Satan cannot take you out of his hand and you won't walk away because true Christians follow Jesus. So the promises of eternal endurance are that once you become a Christian, Jesus won't lose you, you won't quit, you won't walk away, and Satan can't steal you or tempt you out of Christianity. And Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30 tells us that once we become Uh, Once we are called to salvation and we are justified, which means God sees us just like he sees Jesus, God already sees us as if we're glorified. He already sees us in eternity. It doesn't say that some Christians go to eternity or most Christians go to eternity. It said everyone who is called, all of them, who are called to be Christians, who are treated just like Jesus was treated by God, are going to be in eternity with Jesus. So we saw some great promises, but we also saw some warnings. There are some texts in the Bible that appear to say, don't lose your salvation. Uh, These texts are not threats against losing salvation. They are loving admonitions that show us that real salvation endures to the end. So of these texts, we said in this message, the hardest to really understand without great biblical context is a text we find in Hebrews chapter 6, verses uh, 1 through 12. And as we look at Hebrews chapter 6 today, the goal of this podcast is going to be to walk you through one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament that people like to point to to say, it appears that the Bible says you can lose your salvation. The promises of Jesus tell us that we cannot. The warnings of Jesus tell us that Christians do not. 1 John tells us really clearly the only people who walk away were never with us because once you're with Jesus, you don't walk away. But there's a difficult text in Hebrews chapter 6 that we want to study today. So I'm going to read you through it. Uh, If you're driving, this is probably going to be a a podcast that you're going to have to listen to twice. Uh, If you're watching on YouTube or one of our online platforms, you might pause it. Go grab your Bible and a journal and a pen. But we're just going to walk through Hebrews chapter 6 in this podcast and learn the truth about a text that appears to say you can lose your salvation so that we can have great intimacy with Jesus and not live in fear. So here's what Hebrews chapter 6 says. The author says, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. Then he says this in verse 4. It's a troublesome text. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who've tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful for those whom it is farm received the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless, and it's in danger of being cursed. In the end, it'll be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we're convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown in him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end, so that what you hope for may be fully realized, but we do not want you to become lazy. Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So wow, if you're doing your devotions one day and you're, and you're reading for the day, it's Hebrews chapter 6, and you're not real familiar with the book of Hebrews, you may read across Hebrews 6, 1 through 12 and think, holy cow, it is not only possible to fall away from Jesus, but if I do, I can't ever be saved again. Christian, what do you do with the promises of salvation, the warnings that tell us that real Christians endure to the very, very end? What do you do with a text like 1 John 2, 19 that says the only people who walk away are people who prove they never had faith when you read Hebrews chapter 6? Great question. So let's together study the Bible a little bit in this supplemental podcast. 
that's given to support our Bible teaching series, Blessed Assurance, which was given at Journey in October and November of 2022, if you want to go find it on the website. Here's the first thing you need to understand about the book of Hebrews, the only book in the New Testament, the only letter in the New Testament that does not have an author that scholars contend um, together unanimously is the author of the book. Here's what you need to know about the book of Hebrews. It's really not a book. It's really not a letter. It's a sermon. Um, The book of Hebrews is a sermon meant to be delivered from start to finish, and a sermon that probably was delivered from start to finish over and over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, scholars believe this letter was a sermon given so many times that the person who heard this sermon wrote it down, and because it wasn't their sermon, they didn't put their name on it. They may not have asked permission of the guy who preached the sermon, so they didn't put his name on it, but they heard it so often, they remembered it verbatim, and they put it down, and God allowed it to be included into the canon of Scripture. This, in in my opinion, in my belief, in the scholarly research that I have done, here's what I believe the book of Hebrews is. I believe that it is the first sermon the Apostle Paul preached in every city that he went to. If you read through the book of Acts, you read that before the Apostle Paul ever talked to Gentiles, non-Jews, about who Jesus was, that in every city he went to, he found a synagogue, and he would be invited to speak at these synagogues, and he would stand up, and from the Old Testament scriptures, he would argue and prove that Jesus was the Messiah. I believe the book of Hebrews is that sermon that the Apostle Paul gave hundreds of times in hundreds of synagogues. I believe it was probably written by the book of Luke, or, or by the Dr. Luke who wrote the book of Luke and who wrote Acts, but who, but who was plagiarizing Paul, or potentially Apollos, who was a teacher that Paul taught, who also went into Jewish synagogues and argued with people of the Jewish faith that Jesus was the Messiah. With that backdrop, what you have in Hebrews chapter 6 is a part of a sermon preached in a synagogue to Jewish people who were practicing the Jewish faith, and that shapes the context for how we have to understand this text so that we can understand what it is saying and what it is not saying, very specifically that it is not saying you can lose your salvation, and if you do lose your salvation, you can never be saved again. So I want to walk through this text together to give you a good understanding of what it means. And this is one of those podcasts. I'm not extremely technologically advanced. Uh, I have a lot more content that is put onto technological platforms than I even know how to work myself. But if there's a way to star this one, save this one, download this one, and send it to friends who may have struggled with this issue... This is a good Bible study podcast to pass along. So let's break into this sermon. Let's picture ourselves sitting in the synagogue 2,000 years ago. Probably in the room are just a group of Jewish men who practice the Jewish faith. On Passover, they're traveling to Israel to go to the temple. They probably celebrate Sukkot, that Feast of Tabernacles where they live in a tent once a year. They certainly would celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And these Jewish men have visited the temple in hopes that the God of Israel, through the high priest of Israel and the sacrificial system of Israel, would not only cover their sin, but also in hopes that one day God would send them a Savior. What do we read in this message to them? Let's start off Hebrews 6 with that backdrop. Possibly Paul or Apollos or Timothy or Titus standing in a synagogue talking to Jewish people about who Jesus is and how he is God's Messiah. Let's start in the first three verses. Here's what the pastor is going to say. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ. And now, if you have your pen, you need to circle the word Christ, and you need to realize in this context, this is a title, not a name. He's, he's not giving Jesus' last name. Jesus' last name was not Christ. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. The Hebrew word uh, would be Mashiach. The English word is Savior. The author, the author is basically saying, let us therefore move beyond the elementary teachings about the Messiah. So these Jewish men all know the Messiah is coming, but they're still practicing their Jewish faith. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death and of faith in God, instructions about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. 
first mistake people make when they think this text is talking about losing your salvation. None of these things the author is talking about pertain to Christianity. These are six things practiced in the Jewish faith and referenced in the Jewish scripture. The elementary teaching about the Messiah is everything they knew before Jesus. That's what the author is saying. We have to get beyond what I will call Old Testament Judaism. Uh, I heard a scholar on this passage say this. The author is trying to say, let's quit talking about what we've learned about the Messiah and now meet him personally. That's what he's saying. Let's move beyond the things that we've taught. Um, not the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death. The Old Testament taught the Jewish people to come and bring their sacrifices in the first few chapters um, of the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy so they could be forgiven. It taught them how to say sorry to God. Um, we need to move beyond the foundation about having faith in a bigger God. That's the whole Pentateuch, the people of Israel learning to have faith in a God that they could see that stepped in and rescued them from Egypt. Instructions about cleansing rites. Some New Testament translations label this instructions about baptism rites. That is not the word used. It literally is cleansing rites. It's teaching, it's, it's telling us the Old Testament taught us how to be clean, how to wash our hands. These Old Testament cleansing rituals that would help us approach God. The laying on of hands, you're like, I've seen that done in church. That's not what that means. That's talking about when the priest and the head of the family would lay their hand on the animal that was being sacrificed to transfer my sin to the animal so that the animal could be killed on my behalf. The resurrection of the dead. He said, there's just some basic foundational stuff about the resurrection in the Old Testament. Job talks about it briefly. David wishes that it was real in the book of Psalms, but not a lot about the resurrection, just some foundational stuff. Uh, the foundational stuff about eternal judgment. The Hebrews of the Old Testament knew that God would eternally one day judge the world, but just in a very basic way, the pastor's talking to these Jewish people, thinking, listen, you've got this Jewish faith, but it has just barely laid the foundation about what the Messiah would do. All of these things are pictures of what the Messiah will do, but all you know is what the Messiah will do. In these days, Jesus has become the Messiah, and you can't miss him. So they're saying your Jewish faith and Jewish foundations have brought you to this point but now you have to trust in Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, I found out it's, it's interesting. In America, we use a phrase to describe Jewish people ha who have become Christians. Um, a lot of American Christians uh, call them Messianic Jews. Here's the silly thing about that when you go to Israel. Every Jew is a Messianic Jew. They're all waiting on the Messiah. And some of them are still waiting on the Messiah. I've not met a Jewish person who practices the Jewish faith, who would describe themselves as anything less than a Messianic Jew because they're all waiting on the Savior of the world. A lot of the Jewish Christians in Israel call themselves completed Jews, not converted Jews because they didn't convert to Judaism. They just believe Jesus completed Judaism. He was the Messiah that the foundational truths have been teaching about. And when Jesus came, they saw him as God's Messiah. So they call him Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Uh, these, not Messianic Jews, because they all are, but these Jesus Jews s took the foundation of Old Testament Judaism and added to that Jesus. So the author starts by saying, you've got this great foundation of Old Testament Judaism. Awesome. But don't miss Jesus. So here's what he says. In verse 4, let's look at the next section. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened. You might circle that word enlightened who have tasted, you know, let's circle that word tasted, the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. Let's stop right there. He said, you are Jewish people who have all the foundations of, that God laid in the Jewish scriptures for the nation of Israel. And he said, in this age, you have been introduced to Jesus and his Holy Spirit. And you've experienced it. Not only have you heard about it, but you've experienced it. He used the words, you've been enlightened. The word enlightened in the Greek language is the word there, photizo. It literally means to, to, to become aware because somebody shines a light on it. He said, you have become aware with your Jewish past. You have now become aware that somebody has come claiming to be the Messiah. Uh, 
And he said, you've shared in the Holy Spirit. You have been a part of the generation that the Holy Spirit has begun to work in. You've tasted the goodness and the word of God. You've had presented to you the words of God and the life of God in the person of Jesus. And you've experienced all of his power in the signs and wonders of the early church, proving that what was happening in the early church was supernatural and of God. He said, those of you who have this foundation of Judaism have now been made aware of Jesus. And it has been very clear that what Jesus has been doing is supernatural. This text does not say it's impossible for those of you who are saved. As a matter of fact, salvation is never described as just tasting the heavenly gift. Um, This is pointing very specifically to this Jewish audience, to people who were fed in the wilderness with the manna of God, people who were refreshed in the wilderness with water from the rock. They ate the manna, they drank the water, they were able to experience what God was doing, but they never experienced the promise of salvation because they did not connect to the God of heaven. For those of us New Testament readers, we would connect this to Jesus feeding the 5,000 people who became aware of who Jesus claimed to be and his supernatural power, and they even partook of his supernatural power. They ate of the fish and loaves that were supernaturally created by his power, but then the next day they all turned back and followed, uh, turned back from following him. The author of Hebrews is saying this Jewish history laid the foundation for you to look for the Messiah, and now you've been made aware of the Messiah, and it's been very, very clear what the Messiah is doing. It's impossible, he would say, if you ignore Jesus as the Messiah, what he's going to say is it's impossible for you to be saved any other way, but very specifically, he's saying that it's going to be impossible for you to be saved by your Jewish faith if Jesus is not your Jewish Messiah. Look at what he says in verse 6. I'm going to pick up in verse 4 because it reads together that way. It reads better that way. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened. You've been made aware that Jesus has claimed to be the Messiah. Who have tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit. You have seen God working through his Holy Spirit in these Christian churches. Who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. You've heard the declaration about Jesus salvation, forgiveness, justification, adoption, all those great words written in the theology of the early church. You've seen the signs and wonders in the New Testament. It's impossible for people like that who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. And then he says this, land that drinks in the rain Often falling off, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful for those whom it is farm receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Here's what the author of Hebrews is saying very, very clearly: You are a generation of Jews who were born into a Jewish faith that pointed to the Jewish Messiah, and in your generation, when you were born, He had not come. But now he is. You are the generation that gets to see the completion of your faith. If you live in the Jewish faith, but you refuse to see Jesus as the Messiah, one, you crucify him all over again, which means you are people who are saying he's a liar. Kill him because you've heard his claim. You've been aware of his power. You've seen him working. And if you still reject him, just like the crowds in Jerusalem did, you would be one that would say, he's a liar. He's saying he's the Messiah. I don't want to follow him. Crucify him. But then he would say this, it's impossible for you who've been made aware of Jesus to put your faith in anything else and think that God will still reward you. And he says, you're like this. He said, you're like land that has been plowed, that has been sowed, that has had really good rain and really good sun and produces nothing. You're proving your heart is hard. You are a generation of people who has had your heart plowed up. You've had the gospel sown. You've had the Holy Spirit doing signs and wonders in a way that should produce fruit. If season after season your heart still doesn't produce fruit, all it proves is that your heart is hard and nothing can ever be sown in you or brought to life in you. And land like that is eventually condemned and eventually burned. So he's very specifically talking to a narrow group of Jewish people who only lived once, a generation that was born before Jesus, lived through Jesus, and then was rejecting Jesus, thinking, well, maybe there's a Savior after him. The author saying, there is no Savior after Jesus. 
this is almost this a little more in-depth teaching on the summary that Jesus would give in Matthew 12, 31, when he said the only sin that's unforgivable is the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying the only thing you can't be forgiven of is trying to earn salvation some other way than by coming to me in faith because there is no other way to salvation. That's what the author of Hebrews 6 is saying. You Jewish people who understood the Jewish faith and were introduced to the Jewish Messiah, if you say no to Jesus, there's no more Jewish Messiah coming. He's the only one. And now everything you do in the Jewish faith, you do on your own instead of leading to who Jesus was and what Jesus did for you. And then he would say this at the end of Hebrews chapter 6. Even though, verse 9, we did, even though we speak like this, dear friends, So now he's talking to the Christians in the congregation. Even though we speak like this to the Christians, he's saying this. We're convinced of better things in your case. The things that have to do with real salvation. He says in verse 10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. He said, listen, as he's preaching this message to this congregation, he says, we know some of you in here are authentic believers because your work for Jesus and your love for God prove that. Watch what I'm saying. Your work for Jesus and your love for Jesus does not earn your salvation. But what the author is saying and the New Testament is full of saying is this, when you are an authentic Christian, your love for God shows and your work for God shows. They are evidences of your salvation. They're not your responsibility, but they are your response. You fall in love with God. You work for God because you love God. Not to earn your salvation, but as evidence of your salvation. And then he says this. I love how he closes the text. He says, therefore, don't become lazy, but imitate what healthy Christianity is. Why would he say that? Because he's speaking to a Jewish crowd that was saying this. We bring our offerings every Sabbath. Um, and those would be sacrifices, really not money. Um, We celebrate all the festival of the unleavened bread. We celebrate every Passover. We celebrate uh, every Sukkot. We celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. We celebrate every new moon. We're doing all these Jewish things. Now you're telling us those don't save us, but they only point us to Jesus. So we'll follow Jesus, and they they think this, and the author's telling them, don't do it. If all of these things don't save us and Jesus does, I guess we'll follow Jesus and do nothing. And the author's saying, don't do that. That'd be lazy. Don't think because Jesus saves me and I can't save myself that you don't have to do anything spiritually. But imitate Jesus and Jesus' followers. Keep working, not to earn your salvation, but as evidence of your salvation. Keep serving. Keep bringing offerings to God. Not as a responsibility so you can be saved, but as your response to being saved. Hebrews 6, when you understand the context is not only not a text that teaches that you can lose your salvation. It is a text that shows the glory in the salvation of Jesus as well as any text in the Bible. It teaches a Hebrew people that their entire life they had learned the elementary things of faith, the fact that sin needed to be repented of, the fact that God had to be believed in, the fact that offerings should be brought, the fact that sin had to be transferred, the fact that there was life after death, um, all of those things, the author of Hebrews says, you've known, and they've drawn your heart towards Jesus, and now you've been, a made, you've been made aware of who he is. So don't turn your back when you're presented Jesus. Later in this text, he would say, today is the day of salvation. So don't harden your hearts today. So my hope in this podcast, which was supplemental to our series, was not only to show you a text that doesn't teach that you can lose your salvation, but to show you a text that does teach how great Jesus is. Jesus is the one that fulfilled every Old Testament prophecy. Jesus is the one who fulfilled and accomplished every Old Testament faith tradition that there was. And at the very end of this text, the author says, and because of what Jesus has been done for you, don't be lazy spiritually, but serve him all the more. So I'm really glad you listened to our Activate podcast today. The next Activate podcast that we will drop will be on December 15th. On that podcast, my wife Danielle and I will be interviewing a couple who's coming over Thanksgiving weekend at Journey. Their names are Daniel and Brittany Brooker. Uh, They both lost their spouses in their 30s. 
They remarried, they've become a blended family, and we're gonna ask them very specifically about grief at Christmas and how you celebrate family and new family while remembering old family that was lost Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, uh, New Year's Eve. We're gonna talk very specifically about celebrating and grieving and mourning all at once over the holidays. I think not only it'll be one of our most listened to and watched podcasts, I think it will probably be our most shared podcast in the history of the Activate podcast because every one of us knows somebody who's hurting, who's trying to figure out, hey, this Christmas, um, how do I feel permission to be happy and celebrate Christmas with a new family and still mourn the loss of my old family? So I think it's going to be a really, really good podcast. And then in early January, we'll be dropping an Activate podcast probably early in the month about Bible reading and very specifically how to get off to a really good start in 2023 reading your Bible. So thank you for joining us today on the Activate podcast. We'd love on the platform that you uh, watch or listen to for you to rate us. That helps more people find the content that we're putting out. And we hope to catch you next time, next month on the Activate podcast where we have a real heart to encourage people um, to be active in the faith. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Activate. We would love for you to join us in person for one of our weekly worship experiences. You can find out more information about JCI on our website at takethejourney.cc. Help us get the word out about this resource. You can do so by subscribing, reviewing, and sharing this episode on your favorite social media platform. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time on the Activate Podcast.